I've been, uh, I've been in this, this series for uh, the last few weeks because we started off 2022 talking all about legacy, about legacy. And I want to make sure that, that we can leave a legacy. My goal for all of you guys is to be people who don't just live a fast life. I want you to live a life that lasts. I want you to live a life that after you're gone, after your life, your time here on earth has ended, your kids, your grandkids, your community, your friends are still talking about your faithfulness. They're still discussing what God did through and in your life. They're still talking about it because of how much they recognize what God's done and how you lived your life. And I want to do that. I want to convince you over the next, this, this next, honestly, 12 months, and that's why I'm laying this foundation, that, that you should live a life that's about something that lasts, leaving a legacy, building something in your life that's going to outlive and outbless you. And I told you the reason why I wanted to start with this, with Firm Foundation, is if we're going to build something that lasts, you got to put it on a good foundation. You can't build it on something shaky because it'll fall apart. No matter what it is that you build, it's got to have this firm foundation. And I read you this verse. I'm going to read it to you one more time as we've gone through this because it bears repeating so that you catch the wisdom inside of these words of Jesus. Luke 6, 46 through 49. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says this, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I'll show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it's well built. But anyone who hears and then doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. I was telling you this because when we talk about the idea of like a firm foundation, we need to recognize that Jesus actually spoke this one time where he says, hey, there is a way to put a solid foundation underneath of your life. And he says, what it is, I'm going to bring wisdom and I'm going to bring my truth and I'm going to present it to you. And he says, if you hear it and then you just walk away, he says, it doesn't really do any good. But if you hear it and then you obey it, you bring it into your life and you apply it. He says, it's like putting this rock solid foundation underneath of your life. And that's what I've been trying to focus on for these last few weeks is talking about some of the foundational things that Jesus spoke into our life. That if we begin to live them and put them into practice to obey them, I believe you're going to have a foundation that when you start thinking about building something that lasts, there's going to be something underneath of it where it can stand. We talked about prayer, serving, worship, people. Today I want to talk to you about some little things. What I mean is this, when I talk about like legacy and I want you to live a legacy, it's kind of this much bigger vision for our life, right? Instead of this really small vision of just like, you know, buying some stuff, experiencing some stuff, the idea of building legacy is really this, this big thing, right? And you can have this feeling then that like, okay, so like, then there must be some big thing that I need to do to be able to accomplish this. There's likely a big goal I need to accomplish. There's likely some big things that need to be done. But what I want to start with when we talk about kind of this firm foundation is actually, I believe, that one of the most important things when we start talking about legacy and a firm foundation to build something that lasts isn't the big things, it's actually the little things. That actually the little things are what sit underneath of what we want to build. The little things all added up are actually some of the most important pieces of a firm foundation. I told you before, okay, when it comes to a foundation, this isn't exciting, it's not really like sexy, right? Like, oh, your foundation, right? Nobody's really interested in the foundation, but it's critical to have. And that's the case with this. When we talk about the little things in our life, this might actually be the most critical part that you get right in this next year to laying a firm foundation and building a legacy, not some big giant thing that you accomplish. One of my favorite uh, things to do, I I'm really uh, into like reading and learning about people who are currently uh, really successful business people, all this. Like, I just love that stuff. I'll listen to books, listen to podcasts, listen to interviews with people who are, uh, you know, CEOs of businesses who have, you know, revolutionized an industry. I love hearing how they think. 
I love hearing how they live and kind of trying to distill some of that into my own life. I don't have any, you know, like sometimes there's this current culture of like hating people if they're successful. I think it's foolishness. There's reason why people are successful and they're literally telling you their secrets almost every day if you're willing to listen to them. So I love listening to these people. But one of the things that have kind of been interesting is as I've listened about a lot of these different CEOs, people who've revolutionized industry, created amazing products, people who are like, these guys are just amazing. These women are fascinating in regards to the way they think, okay? One of the things I've noticed is although they're so like big picture, they're so like important in regards to how they're thinking, they're not less intentional about the small things in their life. They're actually more intentional. You would think like, oh, these people are just so high level. They're so important. Like, but I mean, they probably just wake up and like everything else is taken care of. And it's just like they just get into like some sort of, you know, like, I don't know, liquid flotation tank and they think up and dream up stuff. Right. Like and it's not the case at all. In fact, these people who are extremely like, you know, wow, this person, how they're thinking is mind blowing. You listen to them talk about their life and actually they're way more intentional way more detail-oriented about their life than a lot of people who I know in life. You turn, you like listen to them about what, what do you attribute to some of your success in these things, and they'll start talking about miraculous things like sleep. They're like, I change my schedule and I go to bed at the exact same time every single night. I found that if I get nine hours of sleep every single night and I wake up at 4 a.m., I can get more done with my day than if I you know, let that move around. And you're like, that's what you're focused on? You know, I found that my diet is critical, and actually what I do is I eat the exact same breakfast every single day in the morning because it's specifically just exactly what I need and nothing more. And it's like, man, you're all focused, like these little details, right? Like they'll talk about like, hey, you know what it is, is I'm extremely intentional about my time when I'm at home. When I come home at this time, actually, even though I'm like the CEO of this big company, everyone knows my phone goes off, and for the next three, four hours, I'm intentional with my family because if I'm not winning there, I can't win when I go to work the next day. And you're like, these, it's, it's surprising that this, these big picture successful people, they're extremely focused on the details. In fact, I read this book a while ago called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. It's fascinating. He talked about how habits are critical to our lives because what a habit is is something that you do without thinking about it. So if you can change your habits, you can literally revolutionize your life because if you start doing the right things without even making decisions with it, your life kind of starts to freewheel towards success. Really, really interesting. But in this study, he found that not all habits are equal. And he specifically identified something that he called keystone habits. And when he talked about keystone habits, he said they're really interesting because they're usually very small, insignificant habits that he finds then create a through line to create lots and lots of other good habits. And what he's found is as he worked with people about their lives, he's found that when these little tiny keystone habits fall off, the rest of their habits begin to disintegrate. But if they maintain these little habits, all of a sudden the other ones just seem to find their way into order. And he says that they're, they're seemingly insignificant. You'll talk to someone and you'll find out like that really what their keystone habit is, when they get up in the morning, the first thing they do is they make their bed. They put everything together, right? They organize their area first thing. And that keystone habit sets up the rest of their day. For some other people, it's like, right when I get up at this time, the very first thing I do is I go to the gym and I start working out. And if I start my day by sweating, by exercising, the rest of the day just seems to go in the correct direction. Some other people, like I said, it's, it's actually the other side. It's like when I come home at night, if I take and turn my phone off, put it away, and I have an amazing dinner with my family, I notch out an hour or two to really interact with my spouse, to really interact with my kids. I find myself in such a better headspace that if I just maintain that one little keystone habit, everything else seems to kind of flow in the right direction. But the inverse is true. When these keystone habits start to fall off, everything kind of starts to turn to chaos. And you would say, would it really matter if you didn't make your bed? And Charles Duhigg would say, yes, it does. Because that keystone habit sets up these other successful habits in life as well. I believe this is true in our lives. I believe that all of us have keystone habits that then positively affect the rest of our life. And I actually believe that it's true spiritually. 
I believe that when I read through God's word, it's clear that Jesus points out some really little things that are key. The Holy Spirit points out in my life really little things that are key, that if they're done consistently, if they're done continually, all of a sudden everything else begins to flow in the right direction. But when they drop off, everything seems to fall apart. Here's what I want you to get. When we're talking about laying a firm foundation, building a legacy, right, accomplishing kind of these, these big things, I need you to get this today, okay? Doing the little things consistently is foundational, foundational for big results. If you want to have big results in this next year, you think 2022 is the year that I really start to see movement happen in my life, I actually think one of the most important things you could do isn't trying to focus on the the big thing to start when it comes to laying the foundation. It's actually getting focused in on the little things. Because those little things done consistently is foundational for these big results that come along. Now, it's not just that they're little. I said one little caveat inside of that that you might have catched. And it's truly the secret sauce to foundational little things in our life. The word is consistent. Consistent. When it comes to anything we do in our life, I need you to catch this, okay? Anything you're going to do in your life, you can really only change three things about it. You can change the quality of it, you can change the intensity of it, and you can change the consistency of it. Anything you do, doesn't matter what you're doing. You can increase or decrease the quality of something, you can increase or decrease the intensity of it, how long it's done, or you can increase or decrease the consistency as far as how many times you do it. And here's what I have found. Some people will change the quality, some people will change the intensity, but the secret sauce to success is consistency. The secret sauce to taking little things and then becoming big things isn't in having the absolute highest quality version of it. It's not in doing it longer than everyone else does it and doing it to the point where it's going to kill you, but I'm going to push it to the very extreme. The secret sauce is doing it over and over and over and over again. Consistency is truly the key to this area. And when we do little things that are important consistently, that's foundational for big results in our life. I can show you that this is true, okay? Because there are good things that you know you should do, but consistency is the game changer in this area. Does eating healthy food make you healthy? No. Not if you eat one healthy meal a month. If nine of your ten meals are pizza and beer, and one is like quinoa stir-fry or whatever, it's like, I don't understand what's happening. I eat healthy once in a while, and you're like, I can tell you what the problem is, right? Your consistency is messed up. You are consistently eating something that's not beneficial for your health and throwing in that one meal where you're like, oh, but then once a month I eat vegan. And it's like, once a month? That's not going to change anything, right? Definitely. Don't even eat vegan. That's terrible, right? Horrible. (laughs) Everyone's proving that's horrible. But see, the other way is true. If you start saying, no, I'm actually eating the right amounts. I'm actually eating the correct amount of protein. I'm eating the right food every single day. You know, what's interesting about that is if you're consistent in that, I know people who eat really well, they can go and have a meal where they sit down and eat a whole bunch of pizza and beer. And it doesn't affect them. They're like, well, you're in great shape. It's like, that's because nine out of 10 of my meals are good meals, are healthy meals. The consistency is what makes that win. Does exercising make you fit? Well, no, not if you start the year and you decide this is the year and you experience the same thing. Anybody who's a consistent gym goer knows this. The first two, three weeks of January, packed, right? Everyone's there. Everyone's making it happen. But here, February just hit and all of a sudden, well, yeah, I'm not really going anymore. At the end of the year, you're like, I don't understand why I didn't lose all this weight. I mean, I worked out for like those first three weeks of the year. It's like, well, exactly. That's not what what does it. It's consistency. You would have been better not going every day for the first three weeks or pushing yourself to the place where you're like, oh, I hate exercise. I was like, I'm so sick to myself. I I felt terrible afterwards. Like, well, yeah, because you do it so irregularly that when you did it, you felt horrible. Do it two or three times a week for an entire year and you find out, wow, I am way stronger than I was last year. When it comes to an area of our life like getting smarter, you know, I want to read more books this year, I want to learn knowledge, I want, I, when cameras, I want to learn from people like that, I want to do this, right? Does reading books make you smarter? 
Well, not if you read half a book once a year when you go on vacation. You take your week vacation, I'm going to read this book, and you get about halfway through it, and you're like, I don't really feel like I gained anything this year. And you're like, right. But if you bring consistency into that habit and you go, hey, instead of watching Netflix every single night, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to crack open a book and read a chapter every single night, and you start flying through books, and you're like, I'm learning tons. You see, the secret to these little things in our life is as soon as we apply consistency to them, they start accomplishing these massive results in our life. And I believe that this idea of doing the little things consistently is foundational when it comes to our faith as well. There are little things that are critical to our faith. And before we finish up this series, before we start moving on and I start talking to you about legacy living and all these different other things that I want to bring up in your life, what I mean to say is before I finish this series and we move on, I want to stop you for one second and make sure that you get this. You are not moving on to bigger and better things where you forget about the little things. It won't work. If we're going to move on to bigger and better, where it's like we're going to build a legacy, to get there, you have to make sure you understand, I can never stop doing the little things. If I want to build something big, I have to first make sure I got the little things set up in my life consistently. Then I can start moving towards something that will actually bring about this big change. Here's what I want to do. I want to show you just real quick three things. And you're not going to be surprised by any of them. You're not going to be impressed by any of them. But I want to remind you of them because they're things that I see in God's word that God talks about in a consistent manner. In the idea that it's meant to accomplish something in our life and be done over and over and over again. There's lots of things that God talks about is supposed to be in our life and are supposed to be, be part of it. But there are some things that he specifically points out over and over like this is a consistent thing. This is something you got to do over and over again. This is something you have to root inside of your life. And I want to make sure that you get this. And if you're like, yeah, this is obvious, Cameron, then what I want you to do is as I'm talking about it, I want you to think about what your habits are as I'm talking and if your habits line up with consistency or not. The first one that God talks about all the time, we see it as just pattern recognition over and over and over again in God's word, both in the Old Testament and when Jesus came, is this, this concept of prayer. And we make prayer out to be this really, really weird, you know, like, I don't know, super spiritual thing. It's literally talking to God. Replace that in your mind when you think of like prayer, because some of you are like, we do this system and this, and it's like, it's just talking to God. That's why we started out this year by saying, let's get intentional with our 22 days of prayer. Jesus actually explains one time when his disciple was saying like, hey, how do we pray, Jesus? And he actually gave them a pattern in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Listen to this pattern that he gives them. He says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. He says, if you want a pattern, it's really easy. He says, here's some things you can do when you pray. Praise God. Invite his presence into your life. Ask God for the things that you need in your life. Ask God to protect you from the attacks of the enemy, right? And he gives this model, but did you notice what, what stands out to me about this is that when Jesus gives them the model of prayer, did you recognize in the middle of it, verse 11 says, give us today the food we need? Old school translation, KJV, the King Jimmy, it says, give us today our daily bread, right? What does that mean? He, it means that when Jesus gives the pattern of prayer, he patterns inside of it that what you're praying for is today. He says, today, God, would you meet the needs of today? I mean, Jesus could have very easily said in the model and then pray, God, would you just bless the rest of my life and we're good. I don't need to pray anymore, right? Like, God, just take care of everything from here on out. You got it. Cool. We're good. That's not how he patterns it. When he gives the pattern, he says, what you're going to do is you're going to pray about today because there's an expectation that, guess what, you're going to pray about tomorrow. And you're going to pray about the next day. You don't need to focus on months and months and months down the road when you talk to God. You need to talk to God about right now because there's this consistent picture of it. Consistency in prayer is everything. It's everything. Remember I told you it's just talking to God? It's relationship building. 
I've said this before, you, some of you guys know this joke, but I've said, if we consider like how we talk to God and we applied it to another area of our life, just ask yourself if it would work, right? Because I know how some of you have prayed right now, how, you, how you're living your prayer life. I know because I've done it for years and years and years, and I can apply it. I can go like this. So here's how I used to pray, and let me apply it to my wife, Amy, okay? So I wake up in the morning, and I walk downstairs, and I go, hi, Amy. Love you. Um... Be with me today. Uh, keep the kids safe if you can. Um, all right, I'll see you later. And then I just head out and be like, cool. And then the next time I talked to Amy was the next morning. I didn't talk to her that night, didn't talk to her during the day, didn't text her, didn't call her. And the next morning I just came down and was like, hey, Amy, thanks for being my wife. I love you. Um, be with me today. Uh, take care of the kids. I um, uh, got a meeting today. Uh, if you could think about that, that's good. Uh, all right, see you tomorrow. And I head out again. How long do you think that's going to work? Right? But very many of us, like, this is how we talk to God. And we're like, well, you know, like, I pray. And you're like, but I mean, is that what your communication with God is? I mean, that doesn't work for even a relationship as simple as like husband and wife, right? How is it supposed to work in regards to the relationship with the creator of the universe? Don't you think you're meant to have this ongoing conversation to actually bring about what's going on in your life to him, to have communication and listen to him? Not only that, but I've just said over the years, you know, one of my biggest, my biggest things with prayer that I think we just fail at is how many of us just throw a list at God and then just check out and not even listen to his wisdom? You know, prayer is a conversation with God. How many of us spend even two minutes a day talking to God about our life and then going, now, God, I'm just going to listen. You feel free to speak on any of these subjects. Feel free to bring something to mind in this area. I have found that in moments where I pray, when I add moments of listening in my prayer life, all of a sudden I start to really experience things that change my life. I hear God's wisdom on something. Something comes to mind. Someone comes to mind who I need to pray for. I send them a text, and all of a sudden, God would use me to connect to somebody. And we're, here we are. We're just doing like this baseline communication when really it's meant to be something that's done consistently in conversation. I love what the brother of Jesus, James, says in James 5, 13 through 16. He says this, Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praise. Are any of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. He says, you're meant to pray in like every circumstance. He says, what circumstance can you think of? I'm happy. Pray. Thank God for it. I'm sad. Pray. Talk to God about it. I'm sick. Pray. Invite some people to come and pray over you. I'm dealing with sin. He says, pray. Confess your sin to someone else who's a friend and pray for each other. This conversation is meant to happen. You go, yeah, Cameron, I get prayer. But I would say, but do you really? Do you make a consistent habit of this where you're talking to God throughout the day? Some of you send way more communication to your brother or your sister or your best friend via text than you send to God. Maybe you're like, I should set up a phone line that's called like God so you could just text him all day, right? That'd be way better. You could do that. Just pick a random, pick, put it in a note if, you, if that's how you function, right? But are you talking to God on a consistent basis? The other one that obviously you're not going to be surprised by at all, it, it, it's God's word. We say we want to hear from God, but then we don't actually connect with his word. And the Bible is literally God's word written in revelation to man, that God uses it in order to bring revelation to us. Most of us Christians say, well, of course, I believe that that's God's word. Of course, I believe that those are the words of God. But, but do you? Because if you really believe like it's the word of God, then why are so many of us not even reading it at all? Oh, no, 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 I believe it's the word of God. And you're like, well, then why haven't you picked it up in a week? Why haven't you picked it up in a month? If you really think it's the word of God, why aren't we doing something with it? Matthew 4, 1 through 4 says this, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. And during that time the devil came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, 
Tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil comes and says, you're starving. You should make bread. And he says, I need you to understand this, devil. He said, we don't just survive because we consume food on this earth. We survive by hearing the word of God. He literally points to the word. He points to the revelation of God as like bread that we need to consume every single day. Like that we need to eat this. We need to experience this. And I love the way that he talks about that because it's like, it's a daily thing. Sometimes I've told people like, there are some of you who like, oh, I love this like certain type of like Bible study or the certain type of like message that you listen to or the certain speaker who unpacks it. And that's great, right? You're like, it's just so quality. It's so terrific. But the problem is, is then that you don't consume anything of God's word the whole rest of the week. And you're starving, if someone said, I'm just really into like these five-star meals. I mean, they're, they're beautiful. They're gorgeous. They have all the perfect micronutrients. The proteins is terrific. And once a week, I eat one of those. But strangely, about three days later, I start feeling really, really weak and tired. And you'd be like, it's because you need to eat some food in between, man. Like, I was really tired. I mean, it was a great meal, though. And you're like, yeah, but you still just, like, you just need to go home and, like, microwave some macaroni and cheese, right? Like, just base, like, I'm just hungry. There's times for a great five-star meal, but there's also just times that it's like, I just need, like, food. Now. I just need a sandwich. And sometimes people will be like, well, when I read God's word, sometimes, you know, it's not really that big of a deal. I just read some words, and I didn't really take a ton from it. And I go, but you still ate some of God's word. It still felt, it filled some of your spiritual belly. And I'm telling you, a lot of you, the reason why you're having a hard time spiritually, the reason why you're getting knocked down by the devil in your life is because you're trying to go into the ring to do combat with the devil and you haven't ate in days or weeks. You're starving. You're starving and you wonder why you don't have the energy. You're starving and you wonder why you don't have any answer when you hear the lies of the devil brought to your life. It's because you are so starved of God's word because you have no consistency inside of God's word in your life. Paul wrote this to the young protege Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. He says all of it is inspired and all of it is useful. And many of you would say, I believe that. It's not as though you don't believe that God's word is powerful. You don't believe that it is his word. But the problem is, friends, you are failing on consistency. You read God's word for just a few days at the beginning of the year because I inspire you. Or you hear me talk and you're like, well, I heard some of God's word. Or maybe you listen to like one podcast. But you're never just actually consuming God's word consistently. And friend, you're starving yourself. That's where the win comes in. I can tell you for me, when I started actually making a point of daily reading God's word consistently, and it's really simple, you don't need some big complex system, you read a chapter of God's word and you ask yourself, what does this teach me about God? What does this teach me about myself? What does this teach me about the world? And you just apply those things to your life. Someday it's not really miraculous. You're just like, yeah, God's good. Do you think there's anything bad about you spending 10 minutes and just reminding yourself that God's good? Like, well, I didn't really get much out of that. You're like, you got way more than you could even imagine today, man. You reminded yourself that God's good today. That's terrific. That's just like the bowl of mac and cheese, right? Nothing fancy, but it filled me up today. And I'm telling you, for some of you, this like in this next year, you're like, ah, oh, I really want to do big things. I'm telling you, all the way back to the littlest thing. It's like, start reading God's word every day. And you find yourself miles farther along in your faith at the end of the year. You can't build some big, giant legacy if you don't have a firm foundation underneath of it. And some of you are like, I want to do great things for God. I believe that God has great calling for my life, and I believe he does. But you can't build that on a foundation where you literally don't even know any of God's word. I'll tell you all the time, like, God wants to use you to encourage your family. God wants to use you to be able to encourage your community. God wants to use you to be able to speak truth to people, right? And they're like, well, what can I do? And I was like, read God's word. Know God's word. 
Read the New Testament over and over and over again until it's falling out of your Bible because then when people say something about their life, all of a sudden God will bring to mind a scripture that you've read and you'll say, you know, Jesus said this about that circumstance. And a wise word all of a sudden just brings so much change into someone's life and God begins to use you. You'll walk up against the situation and all of a sudden you'll recognize what God has said about this circumstance over and over and over again. And you'll say, you know, God says this is unwise. God says this isn't the purpose for our life. And I'm telling you, the goal, the purpose inside of this, it's all in the consistency. In fact, I read this at the beginning of last year when we did daily, but I don't know if I'm ever not going to read it again because it's so powerful when I talk to you about God's word. Check this out. I'll just blitz through this and you'll catch the main points of this, okay? The Center for Bible Engagement has done an ongoing study with over 400,000 people and they call the study the power of four. Here's their findings. They say this. A lack of scriptural engagement produces several consequences. Disengagement from God's word has left American believers ignorant of basic facts from the Bible and truths, vulnerable to false teaching, and in many cases, spiritually immature. Our research has demonstrated that those who read the Bible at least four times a week are less likely to engage in behaviors such as gambling, pornography, getting drunk, and sex outside of marriage. They actually break these down. If you read your Bible more than four times a week, you're 57% less likely to get drunk, 68% less likely to have sex outside of marriage, 61% less likely to view pornography, 74% less likely to gamble. And not only that, but the positive results are actually massively bigger than the negative results. If you read your Bible four times a week, you're 228% more likely to share faith with others. You're 231% more likely to disciple others. You're 407% more likely to memorize scriptures. But this is what they say. Listen to this. These effects remain even after recontrol for other factors such as church attendance. Perhaps the most important fact that we find is there is no statistically significant differences between those who read or listen to the Bible one to three days a week and those who do not at all. All of those results literally start at a wall of reading God's word four or more times and they said what we found is zero, one, Two and three, no difference whatsoever. We find no statistical difference between the person who reads their Bible zero times a week and the person who reads their Bible three times a week. Isn't that insane? But they said all of a sudden at four, five, six, seven, massive spikes of difference happens. Listen to this. Think about it. As soon as more days of the week have God's word in it than don't have God's word in it, an entire switch flips in your life. As soon as four of the seven, more than 50%, instead of less than half, have God's word in it, all of a sudden massive change begins to happen in your life. I'm telling you, friends, the reason why God talks about his word as being this daily thing we consume is because there is power in the idea of us hearing God's word every single day. Consistency is the key. And last, friends, it's this. It's the experience of of worship and community. It's the church. The church is ecclesia in the Bible. It's the plural of Christian. It's the unity of Christianity. You're each a little part of the church. But God actually gives us special commandment that we are commanded in his word to bring gathering into our life in which we celebrate together, in which we learn together, in which we praise God together. Psalm 8410 speaks of these moments of of, of praise and worship, a place in which the special presence of God exists. Uh, A pastor who I love, uh, Pastor Russell Johnson, he says that church is the place where the omnipresent God specifically makes himself present. Think about that. Where the God who is everywhere becomes somewhere in a special way. And Psalm 8410 says this, A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. The writer says that being with the people of God and celebrating his goodness is more valuable than a thousand days somewhere else. That's three years. He says one day in God's house is better than three years somewhere else. He says, I would rather have a low position in the place where I get to see the worship of God and experience his presence than have some high position in a place that is devoid of your presence. 
There is a special presence of God when we gather together as the church. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, the writer says this, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and to good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Notice in this, he says it's important that we would meet. And he says, let us not neglect. What does that mean? He says, there needs to be consistency in this, friend. Don't be a person who neglects the gathering of the church. It is important. Friend, I need you to get this. And it's not just because like, well, of course, Cameron will tell you, you should be here. It's because God specifically says this is one of the things that's meant to be a consistent habit in our life is gathering with the believers in our area, of getting together so that we can get on mission, of encouraging each other, of sharing faith together, of praising God together, that we experience the omnipresent God in a special way of his presence inside of this aspect of church that happens. And I'll tell you so often there for our church, just, just for reference right now, I know you're like, hey, this is a pretty full room. If all of you showed up, like if all of you who say that you're Acts Church people showed up, there would be no room in this room and there would be no room in the next service. You're like, how is that possible? Because any given week, like about 50, 60% of you guys are here. For real. Like that's actually the reality. There is this constant flow, and I, I stand up here on a regular basis, and I see them like different people in different spots each week, different people who are taking your seat when you're not hearing this. There's this constant churn of people who come and go and come and go and come and go. And I, I love that. You're always welcome in that way, but I'm telling you, you know, one of the hardest things is I'll hear people talk about their life and be like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while, and I don't ever pick on people with that. I don't ever, when I go to stores and people are like, hey, Cameron, and you know, they haven't been there in like six months, and they're always like, we're thinking about coming back. And I'm like, no, you're not. Don't lie to me, right? You just saw me. You're, you don't have to do that. If you, see, if you guys decide to not be at church for the next two months and you see me at Walmart, you don't have to explain where you haven't, why I haven't been here, okay? I'm just shopping too, okay? I'm just... <laughs> It's fine. I'm just getting my stuff too. You don't have to explain. But very often when they'll start talking about their life, they'll say, you know, it's been hard because this has been going on and this has been going on and this has been going on. And I'll say, yeah, we just taught a series about that at church. And I don't mean to do that to shame them. What I mean is, is if you were there, God was already speaking answers to the circumstances in your life. He knew you were going to be going through that, and he's been working on the hearts of your pastors who have been praying about this year and seeking God and saying, God, what words does our church need to hear? And we did a whole series about that subject. We specifically talked about that area of life just a few weeks ago, but you weren't even there to hear God's wisdom in your life. I need you to get, friends, when I tell you you need to be here, it's not because I need you to hear my message, okay? Okay. When people come and they go, oh, Cameron, that was an amazing message. I mean, hey, I'm, I'm glad that I can give what I can to that. But the reason why I tell you you need to be here is because I'm speaking. It's because God's speaking. It's because what our pastors do, what we do is we sit down and we say, God, please would you show us what our church needs to hear? Not what we want to teach. Not like, well, I want to teach this. I want to teach this. We go, what does our church need? To, what's going to get them through this next year? And then God will bring something to our heart and we'll begin to pray over it and say, this is critical and we'll build it out and we'll bring the scripture so that you can understand something. Friends, the the reason of putting this habit of this consistency in your life with this is that's the secret sauce when it comes to church. Being part of the, the most awesome church ever and going there like once every month or two, you're not gonna see some massive change in your life. But just being part of just a regular local body The quality can even be way less. But just being there every week, it makes huge change in your life. You're consistently hearing from God. You're consistently sharing your life with others. It's what makes the difference. And I'm just saying, like, for real, for real, friends, all on this post-COVID world of what we've gone through and all this and on the backside of it, more than ever, I have just recognized the critical component of what this is. COVID hasn't made me think that this is less valuable. It's made me realize this is more valuable. Anyone else? Where you go like, this is, this is valuable. It really is valuable to come together and to share an experience together. There really is power. I love Chris. A few weeks ago, you told me. He says, you know, this morning when I was in worship, it wasn't like I was feeling this like huge thing, but then I looked over and saw somebody else experiencing something that was really powerful and it grew my faith. 
Right, exactly, exactly. There's something powerful about us coming together and sharing this experience together. And if if I may, I'm not going to be jerks to you, okay? I'm not going to be jerks to you guys online. But listen, just for real, in this next year, post-COVID, all this, what I've just realized is I'm just going to stop listening to excuses about why you can't go to church, okay? I, I, I know, I know, absolutely. There's a million of them, isn't there? There's a million. But when I hear it, I have this tendency naturally to just be like, yeah, I know, it's hard. It's not hard. It really isn't hard. You do it every day. You get up and you go somewhere. And this one just happens on Sunday. You're like, ah, but I worked the other days. I'm like, I know, so does everyone else. I know, yes. I'm just going to go, you know what? You you make room for what you value. You make room for what you value. I get it. I know, yeah, but you know what? You make room for what you value. And I'm telling you, this is so valuable for your life. For you who have kids, listen to me. You might have so many things that you think, I'm failing with my kids. I'm failing with my kids. I'm not doing a good enough job with this. I'm not doing a good enough job with this. But listen to me. If you as a parent just say, you know what we do? We consistently go and we celebrate who Jesus is and we're part of a local church. Just instilling that habit miles ahead of so many other people miles ahead of so many other people of just rooting consistency of, hey, we go and we gather, we celebrate, we praise God, we're part of a community of faith. That just being instilled as just a root of like, this is just natural, it's just normal. Huge value to your kids. And I can't tell you how many people I've met who even had prodigal seasons in their life who will come back to faith and say, one thing I am thankful though is my family just always had me just connected to the local church. So it wasn't hard for me to come back after years and years of me being out there sowing my wild oats. Friends, if you want to build a legacy in 2022, you want to build something big, you want to experience this this shift in your life, I actually think in this next year, one of the most foundational things is instead of thinking big, think small. Instead of thinking about this big, giant thing, what are the little things that you just need to get consistent at? Some of you are like, I knew all three of these, Cameron. I knew all of them. And I'd say, of course you did. But ask yourself, are you consistent in them? Are you consistent in them? Is there a way for you to be able to change the consistency to really experience it? Because you might read God's word, but you're like, yeah, but it's, it's hit and miss. You might pray, but yeah, it's just that little tiny, like, two seconds at the beginning of the day, and I don't really have a habit out of that. You might come to church, but it's here, and then it's gone for a season, and here and gone for a season. You're like, man, I just need to change my schedule to go to bed on Saturday night so I can be here and I can hear from God's word. If you want to do something big, you want to leave a legacy, that's massive. What would you be willing to do? I want to leave you with this story, okay? I promise we'll, we'll wrap up with this. 2 Kings 5, there's this fascinating story of a guy named Naaman. I'm going to read it to you really quick, okay? It says, The king of Aram had a great admiration for Naaman, who was the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. So he's sick with leprosy, even though he's a great guy. It says, At this time, the Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who'd been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I'll send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out, carrying his gift 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, With this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, Am I God that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River, and then your skin will be restored, and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became very angry, and he stalked away. I thought he'd certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God to heal me. 
I mean, aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, the Farfar, better than the rivers here in Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and he went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and they said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and he dipped himself seven times. And as the man of God had instructed him, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child, and he was healed. The story is fascinating because Naaman comes and he expects some really, really great moment to happen for his leprosy to be healed. And I love the wisdom of his, his right-hand man, of the people who are around him, where they said, you know, you, you wanted this so bad. I mean, if he would have told you something really difficult, you would have done it, right? Like, you know, go and get this stone from the other side of the mountain, right, and face the dragon and come back. He says, you'd have done it. So he says, why wouldn't you do something that's so easy, that's so little, if that's all he asked you to do? And friends, I tell you that story to say this. What if in this next year, right, you're like, I want to... I want to leave a legacy. I want to, I want to build a legacy. I want to change my family tree. I want to live a life that outlives and outblesses me. And, and if I was to tell you some great big thing that you were supposed to do, you'd probably be like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do whatever it takes. And I would say to you, then will you do something really, really little and simple? Because some of you, you're like, I want to build a legacy this year. But then I go, read your Bible. Pray. Be here in church consistently. And you go, well, surely I expected something more grand than that. That's what's going to leave like a legacy? And I would say, if you really want to, would you just try something little? Because I, I firmly believe this, okay? That for many of us, if we just got consistent in these areas of our life, we'd see massive results by the end of this year. Massive results of saying, how do I get consistent in these areas where I consistently read God's word, where I consistently communicate to him, where I consistently am part of this experience? Little things done consistently are foundational for big results. Where are you least consistent? Where is your consistency drop off? Where are those things where you, you know you're doing the right things, but you're, you're not making a real process out of it. What are the little things that you could shift? Don't just say, I want to read more Bible. You got to make the plan. You got to make the, the plan of here's where I'm going to go. Here's when I'm going to do it. I don't just say, I'm going to pray more. You got to make a time. Turn off the radio on the drive into work. You got to clear out some space. Don't just say, oh, I'm going, to, I'm going to go to church more this next year. What are the things that are stopping you from going? What are the things you need to change to set up yourself? These little things can make the biggest results this next year. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for this day. I pray that we um, would become people of legacy. But God, I pray that you would keep us from fooling ourselves into thinking that we can leave these little things behind. That we're going to get such big picture ideas and such big picture dreams that we're just going to forget about this little stuff. I pray you'd remind us that the little things done consistently, man, that's the foundation for these big changes. I pray that you would inspire change inside of us, that you would help us to figure out what this looks like and apply it to our lives. And I pray that we would see big changes through little things by the end of this year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.